At first, as I lay quiet on the sofa, I found it painfully difficult, I might say impossible, to get rid of the impression of the glare of the flames, their hurry and noise, and the fierce burning smell. My left arm was a good deal burned to the elbow, my right not so badly that I could move the fingers. My hair had been caught by the fire, but not my head or face. Herbert was the kindest of nurses, and at stated times took off the bandages and steeped them in the cooling liquid that was kept ready, and put them on again with a patient tenderness that I was grateful for. Neither of us spoke of the boat, but we both thought of it. I sat with Provis last night, Handel. Two good hours. Where was Clara? Oh, up and down with Gruff and Grim all the evening. He's always pegging at the floor the moment she leaves his sight. I doubt if he can hold out long, though. What with the rum and pepper, I should think his pegging's nearly over. And then you'll be married? How can I take care of the dear child otherwise? Lay your arm out. And Provis? You know, he improves. You remember his breaking off about some woman that he'd had great trouble with? Ah. Oh. I hurt you. No, I, I'd i forgotten her. He went into all of that. And a dark, wild past it is. Tell me every word. Here comes the cool one. Oh! It seems she was young, jealous, and a revengeful woman, Handel. To the last degree. Last? Murder. Who, who did she murder? The deed may not have merited quite so terrible a name, but she was tried for it, and your jaggers defended her. Another stronger woman was the victim. And the young woman was not brought in guilty? No, nope, she was acquitted. You start, I hurt you. You, you. you couldn't be gentler. What else? This young woman and Provis had a little child, of whom Provis was exceedingly fond. On the very evening of the strangling, the young woman sought out Provis and swore she would destroy the child and he should never see it again, then vanished. You, you seem to breathe quickly. Did the woman keep her oath? Herbert? That's better. Then came the darkest part of Provis's life. She did. He says she did. Well, of course. I have no other information. No, 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 to be sure. Now, whether he felt pity or fear he should be called for knowledge about the destroyed child, he hid out of the way of the trial. There he was only talked of vaguely as a man called Abel, out of whom the jealousy arose. After the acquittal, she disappeared. Thus he lost both the child and the child's mother. Did he... A moment, my dear boy, and I've done. Compasson knew all this and held it over Provis's head as a means of keeping him poorer and working him harder. That point barbs Provis's hatred. Did he say when this happened? How old were you when you came upon him in the little churchyard? Seven, I think. Yes. It had happened some three or four years then, he said and you brought into his mind the little girl he'd lost, who would have been about your age. Herbert, you're not afraid that I'm in any fever, or that my head is much disordered by the accident of last night? No, no my dear boy, you're rather excited, but you're quite yourself. I must go and clear this up with Jaggers. Why? The man we have been hiding down the river is Estella's father. That is exactly what happened at Miss Havisham's. And here are her tablets for the 900 pounds. Draw the check, Mr. Wemmick. I am sorry, Pip, that we can do nothing for you. Miss Havisham wished to help me too. I told her no. Oh, every man ought to know his own business best. Every man's business is portable property. Your check, Mr. Pip. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I did, however, ask Miss Havisham to give me some information relative to her adopted daughter. And she gave me all she possessed. Did she? She ought to know her own business best. But I know more of her daughter's history than Miss Havisham herself, sir. I know her mother. I have seen her within these two days. 
and so have you, sir, even more recently. Yes. Perhaps I know more of Estella's history than even you do. I know her father, too. I assure you, I do not. His name is Provis, from New South Wales. And on what evidence, Pip, does Provis make this claim? He doesn't. He never has. He has no knowledge or belief that his daughter is even alive. For once, Mr. Jagger's famous self-control failed him. Then slowly he folded his arms and stared at me with an impenetrable face while I told him everything I knew. Hmm. What item was it you were at, Wemmick, when Mr. Pip came in? I will not submit, sir, to having the subject thrown off in that way. I am surely worthy of some little confidence from you in return for what I've just placed before you. Why do I want assurance of the truth from you? I know how little you care for such poor dreams, but I loved Estella dearly and long. Although I've lost her and must lead a bereaved life, whatever concerns her is still nearer and dearer to me than anything else in the world. Wemmick, I know you to be a man with a gentle heart. I've seen your pleasant home, your old father, and all the innocent, cheerful, playful ways with which you refresh your business life. I entreat you to say a word for me to Mr. Jaggers. I've never seen two men look more oddly at one another than Mr. Jaggers and Wemmick did at my outburst. What's all this? You with an old father? You with pleasant and playful ways? Pip, this must be the most cunning imposter in all London. Not a bit of it. I think you're another. You, you with a, a pleasant home? Yes. Since it don't interfere with business, <laughs> let it be so. No, I look at you, sir. After the first smile your way I've ever seen, I shouldn't wonder if you might be planning and contriving to have a pleasant home of your own one of these days. When you're tired of all this work? <sighs> Pip, we won't talk about poor dreams. You know more about such things than I, having much fresher experience of that kind. But about this other matter, I'll put a case to you. Mind, I admit nothing. Say a woman such as you've mentioned held her child concealed, was obliged to tell her legal adviser for the purposes of her defence, and say that that same adviser held a trust to find a child for an eccentric rich lady to adopt and bring up. And, say, that adviser, living in an atmosphere of evil, saw pretty well nigh all the children he met in his daily business life end up being... Imprisoned, whipped, transported, neglected, cast out, qualified in all ways for the hangman and growing up to be hanged. Say then, here was one pretty little child out of the heap who could be saved, whom the father believed dead and dared make no stir about, and as to whom over the mother the legal adviser had this power... Give the child into my hands and I will do my best to bring you off. If you were saved, your child is saved too. If you were lost, your child is still saved. Say that this was done and the woman was cleared. But say the terror of death had shaken the woman's intellects. And at liberty she was scared out of the ways of the world and went to the adviser to be sheltered. And he kept down her old, violent nature. And say, the child grew up and was married for money. That the mother and father were still living but unknown to each other. And their secret was a secret only you had wind of. For whose sake would you reveal the secret? The mother's? The daughter's? Would you not rather chop off that hand of yours 
and bring her back to disgrace after an escape of twenty years. Now, Wemmick, what item was it you were at when Mr. Pip came in? Hmm? On leaving Little Britain, in no time I had concluded the arrangements for Herbert's future with Clarica. Clarica informed me Herbert would be sent to establish a small branch house in the east. I felt my last anchor with England loosening its hold. But there was huge recompense in Herbert's innocent joy at his fortune. And the dearest Clara Handel, I shall conduct a brilliant princess to the land of Arabian Nights. <laughs> and you shall come out and join us with a caravan of camels. <laughs> and we'll go up the Nile and see wonders. Oh, Handel, Handel, my dear Handel. <laughs> then, in March, a letter from Wemmick. Woolworth. Burn this as soon as read. Early in the week, or say Wednesday, you might do what you know of if you felt disposed to try it. Now, burn. I can't row with these hands. I've been thinking. We can use Startop. A skilled hand, fond of us, enthusiastic. How much would you tell him? Very little. Let him suppose it a mere freak. Then on the morning, say there's urgent reason for getting your Provis aboard and away. Where will you go? Anywhere, so that he's out of England. Any foreign steamer that will take us up will do. But we have to be beyond Gravesend if we want to be beyond searches. We made full inquiries immediately and found a steamer for Hamburg suited our purposes best. I then went to get passports and Herbert to see Startup at his residence. It was agreed those two would row, I steer, and our charge would be sitter. As the others reported for work... I made my way back to Garden Court. Greeting me was another letter, very dirty, though not ill-written. If you are not afraid to come to the old marshes tonight, or tomorrow night at nine, and to come to the little sluice house by the lime kiln, you had better come. If you want information regarding your Uncle Provis, you had much better come and tell no one, lose no time. You must come alone. Bring this with you. I resolved to go. The reference to my uncle Provis coming fast on Wemmick's letter and the morning's busy preparation turned the scale. I left a note for Herbert saying I'd decided to hurry down and ascertain for myself how Miss Havisham was faring. By then I had barely time to reach the coach office, catching the coach just as it came out of the yard. Avoiding the Blue Boar, I put up at an inn of minor reputation in the town and ordered dinner. While it was preparing, I went to Satis house and heard Miss Havisham was still very ill, though considered something better. At eight, I had my coat fastened round my neck and sorted my pockets for the letter, but I couldn't find it and was uneasy to think it must have been dropped in the straw of the coach. But I knew my appointed places and I set out for the marshes. There was a full red moon above a ribbon of clear sky, but in minutes it disappeared into piled mountains of clouds. It was past a half hour before I drew near the kiln, its fires made up and left, the whole place burning with a sluggish, stifling smell. Then I saw a light at the sluice house. The abandoned, broken place was of wood with a tiled roof. There was a lighted candle on a table, a bench, and a mattress on a truckle bedstead. Is there anyone here? Anyone here? <coughs> then suddenly the candle was extinguished by some violent shock and I was caught in a strong running noose thrown over my head from behind. No, I got you. 
Who is it? Not only were my arms pulled close to my sides, but the pressure on my bad arm was unendurable. A man's hand was set against my mouth while I was fastened tight against the wall. Oh, no. Call out again and I'll make short work of you. My arm felt as if, having been burned before, it was now being boiled. A flare of light then flashed up. Orlick. Whom I had looked for, I don't know. I had not looked for him. I made out I was fastened to a stout perpendicular ladder, a fixture to the wall leading to the loft. Down by me! Let me go! I'll let you go to the stars. All in good time. Why have you lured me in here? Because I mean to do it all myself. One keeps a secret better than two. Do you know where you saw this gun for? Speak, Wolf! At Miss Havisham's. You cost me that place, you did. You did. And that would be enough oh. without more. How dare you come between me and a young woman I liked? When? When didn't you? It was you as always give old Ornick a bad name to Biddy. What was it you said to her? You'll take any pains and spend any money to drive me out of this country. What are you going to do to me? <laughs> I'm going to have your life. You goes out of old Ornick's way this present night. He'll have no more on you. You're dead. <laughs> oh, don't look round. There's no escape. I won't have a bone of you left on earth. I'll put your body in the kiln and let people suppose what they may of you. I shall never know nothing. <laughs> Wolf! Old Alex is going to tell you something. It was you as did for your shrew sister. You! I come up from behind her like on you tonight. I give it her. But it weren't old Orlick as did it. It was you. You was favoured. And he was bullied and beat. You done it. No, you pays for it. Who was the someone who arrived when your uncle arrived at Garden Court? Eh? <laughs> I've took up with new companions and new masters. Some of them write my letters when I want some rope, Wolf. They write fifty hands. Compasson? His business was the swindling. Handwriting forging. They're not like sneaking you as writes only one. I've had a firm Duh. mind and a firm will to have your life since you was down here at your sister's burying. And I've looked after you to know your ins and outs, for I says somehow or other, I'll have him. <laughs> What? When I looks for you, I finds your Uncle Provis. Eh? <gasps> but when old Orlick come for to hear that your Uncle Provis had most like wore the leg iron what old Orlick had picked up, filed asunder on these very meshes ever so many year ago, and what he kept by him till he dropped your sister with it. Like a bullock, as he means to drop you. Hey! <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, the burnt child dreads the fire. 
old Orlick knowed you was burned. <laughs> When old Orlick come to hear you were smuggling your Uncle Provis away, he knowed he'd have got you. You'd come tonight. Now, I'll tell you something more, Wolf, and this ends the talking. There's them that can't and that won't have Magwitch. I, I knows the name. Won't have Magwitch alive in the same land with them. Perhaps it's them that writes with fifty hands, and that's not like sneaking you, as writes but one. Beware, Compassin Magwitch, and the gallows. <laughs> He stooped suddenly, drunkenly, and I saw in his hands a stone hammer with a long, heavy handle. Help! Help! Handle? Herbert? I think he's all right. But ain't he just pale, though? How did... Uh, Softly, gently, dear Handel. Don't be too eager. Where's Orlick? Escaped. Startled. Remember what he's going to assist us in, and be calm. Who's this boy? I work for Mr. Trab, the outfitter. He led us here. The time's not gone by, has it, Herbert? No, it's still Sunday night. Gently they rebound my arm and explained everything. Startop had found the real letter. In my hurry, I must have dropped it. Its tone was so different to the one I'd left for Herbert. They both took a post-chaise here, found Trab's boy lounging outside the Blue Boar, and hurried for the sluice house to hear my cries. We must notify a magistrate. No, no, any delay, Herbert, might be fatal to Provis. No, no, we must return to Garden Court now. At Garden Court, I was kept very quiet, my arm constantly dressed and given cooling drinks. But whenever I slept, I was in the nightmare of the sluice house. This was combined with the fear of falling really ill and being unfitted for the adventure ahead. But as no ill news came, I increasingly found rest. Wednesday morning finally dawned. The coming sun, a marsh of fire on the horizon. When the tide turns at nine o'clock, look out for us and stand ready, you over there at Mill Pond Bank. It was one of those days when it is summer in the light and winter in the shade. Of all my worldly possessions, I took no more than the few necessaries that filled my bag. The tide, beginning to run down at nine and being with us till three, we intended to run with it, and then, when it turned, row against it till dark. By then, we would be below Gravesend, and somewhere solitary could be found for the night. On Thursday morning, we would meet the Hamburg steamer. The moving river freshened me with new hope. I felt mortified to be of so little use in the boat, but there were few better oarsmen than my two friends, and they rowed with a steady stroke that was to last all day. Mill Pond Bank. Is he there? Not yet. He wasn't to come down till he saw us. There he is. Easy, Herbert. Dear boy, faithful dear boy, well done. Thank you, thank you. Uh. At the stairs, I'd looked warily for any sign of our being suspected and seen none. Now, among the clanging shipbuilders' yards, we were not followed. If you know, dear boy, what it is to sit here along with my dear boy and have my smoke, after having been day by day in four walls, you'd envy me. I think I know the delights of freedom. 
not equal to me. But I ain't going to be low. If all goes well, you'll be perfectly free and safe again within a few hours. Well, I hope so. But for your face, I should think you were a little despondent. Not a bit on it, dear boy. It comes of flowing on so quiet. And it had air rippling in the boat's head, making a sort of a Sunday tune. Maybe I'm not growing a trifle old, besides. The tide ran strong, and I took care to lose none of it. It was yet with us when we were off Gravesend. By dint of this, a quarter of an hour's rest proved all our oarsmen wanted. Ashore, we ate and drank what we had with us, and looked about. It was like my own marsh country, flat and monotonous, and with a dim horizon. Then the tide turned, but Herbert and Startop persevered and rowed and rowed and rowed until the red sun went down. Night was falling fast. It was very cold, and De Collier coming by us with her galley fire smoking and flaring looked like a comfortable home. What was that? At this dismal time, we were all possessed by the idea that we were followed. I think it's a boat. At length, we saw a light and a roof, a public house alongside a little causeway. There, gratefully, we found two double-bedded rooms, eggs and bacon to eat, various liquors to drink, and by a good fire in the kitchen, a grizzled male creature, Jack. Slimy and smeary and wearing a bloated pair of boots. Relics he'd taken off a drowned seaman washed ashore. <laughs> hey, you have seen a four-odd galley going up with the tide and two sitters? No. Nah, they put him with a stone two-gallon jar for some beer. I'd have been glad to poison the beer myself or put some rattling physic in it. He thinks they was what they wasn't. I know what I think. You think they was custom house? I do. Then you're wrong, Jack. Did you see their buttons? What'd you make out they done with them? Swallowed them. Chucked them overboard so no one sees them. A four and two sitters don't go hanging and hovering up with one tied and down with another and both with and against another without there being custom house at the bottom on it. This dialogue made us all uneasy and for the most part destroyed my sleep. We had decided to stay near the house until close to the steamer's time. The sign of the house, creaking and banging, woke me early, and rising softly not to wake my charge, I looked out of the window. Two men were looking into our hauled-up boat. Then, looking at nothing else, they passed beneath the window and struck out across the marsh towards the Nore. You were all too fast asleep for me to disturb you. Very likely they are from the custom house, but they've no thought of us. Nevertheless, we remain hidden till we see the steamer smoke. Then we get in the track of it. At what hour, my dear boy? One o'clock. But it was half past one before we saw her smoke. Then, as we left the shore, I saw a four-oared galley shoot out from under the bank a little way ahead of us and row out into the same track. By now, the steamer was visible, coming hard on. Keep before the tide, Herbert. Sit quite still. Trust to me, dear boy. Meanwhile, the galley, which was very skillfully handled, had crossed us and fallen alongside. Leaving just enough room for the play of the oars, she kept alongside, drifting when we drifted and pulling a stroke or two when we pulled. Of the two sitters, one held the rudder lines and looked at us attentively, as did all the rowers. The other sitter was wrapped up, much as Provis was, and seemed to shrink and whisper some instruction to the steerer as he looked at us. Not a word was spoken in either boat. Then, when her shadow was absolutely upon us... You have a return to transport there. That's the man wrapped in the cloak. His name is Abel Magwitch, otherwise Provis. I apprehend that man and call upon him to surrender and you to assist. At the same moment, you ran the galley aboard of us. 
The steersman of the galley grabbed Mac Wedge's shoulder, and both boats swung round and round with the force of the tide. Then I saw Mac Wedge start up and pull the cloak from the shrinking sitter in the galley. It was Compson. Still in the same moment, I saw his face tilt backward with a white terror on it that I shall never forget, and heard a great cry on board the steamer, and a loud splash in the water, and felt the boat sink from under me. It was but for an instant that I seemed to struggle with a thousand mill wheels and a thousand flashes of light. That instant passed, I was taken aboard the galley. Herbert was there, and Startop. But the two convicts were gone. At first, I could not distinguish sky from water, or shore from shore. But soon the galley was righted with great speed, and every man looked silently and eagerly at the water astern. Presently, a dark object bore towards us on the tide. No one spoke. As it came nearer, I saw it to be Magwitch, swimming, but not freely. He was taken on board and instantly manacled at the wrists and ankles. Please don't. Of the other body, no sign whatsoever. The galley was kept steady, and the silent, eager lookout resumed long after the water was still again. At the inn. We were received with no little surprise and allowed to get some comforts for my charge. Is that better? Thank you, Bibbs comrade. Oh. Oh. <coughs> this chest that were against the side of the galley, <coughs> Pip, my dear boy, come close. I weren't escaping. <clears throat> that villain, Coppison, <clears throat> he went back. We went in. We was locked like chains. He was a struggling, but I got off and swam away. It was him coming back, took me in. <clears throat> the officer gives the same account. We have permission to get you clean clothes. My pocketbook. <coughs> the officer has it. You, you going to stay with me, dear boy? Yes, I'll be with you. When the tide turned, Magwitch was carried down to the galley and put on board, and I took my place by his side, for that was my place henceforth while he lived. My repugnance had all melted away, and in the hunted, wounded, shackled creature who held my hand in his, I only saw a man who had felt affectionately, generously towards me with great constancy through a series of years. I only saw in him a much better man than I had been to Joe. I wish you hadn't come home for my sake, dear boy. I'm quite content to take my chance. I've seen my boy, and he can be a gentleman without me. Look here, dear boy. It's best as a gentleman should not be known to belong to me now. Only come to see me as if you come by chance with women. I will never stir from your side when I am suffered to be near you. Please God, I will be as true to you as you have been to me. The sole defence is to admit nothing. Until there is a witness, we admit nothing. The sole witness may be drowned. If the witness is there, there is no power on earth can prevent the case going against us. If the witness is there, it will be over in five minutes. I am desirous, sir, that Mr. Magwitch should be kept in ignorance of the total loss of his wealth, which you let slip through your fingers to be forfeited to the crown. But we must memorialize it by and by, and try at all events for some of it. I am resolved never to attempt any claim on him. 
Compasson's body was found, and after three days' delay, during which a witness from the prison ship was produced in his stead, Magwitch was committed for trial at the next sessions a month hence. We shall lose a fine opportunity if I put off going to Cairo. I'm very much afraid I must go, Handel, when you need me most. Herbert, I shall always need you, because I'll always love you. But my need is no greater now than at any other time. You'll be so lonely. I don't have time to think of that. I'm with him always, to the full extent of the time allowed, and when I come away, my thoughts are still with him. My dear fellow, have you thought of your future? In this branch house of ours, Handel, we must have... Um, a clerk. Who could expand, as a clerk of your acquaintance has, into a partner. In short, dear boy, will you come to us? Thank you both. But I, I cannot be sure of joining you yet. But if you thought, Herbert, that you could, without doing injury to your business, leave the question open for a little while... For any while? Six months? A year? No, no, uh, two or three months at the most. Yes. <laughs> this gives me the courage to tell you truly now. I must go away at the end of the week. And Clara? The dear little thing holds dutifully to her father as long as he lasts. But that won't be for long. And then I shall come back for the dear little thing and we will walk quietly into the nearest church. Remember, she comes of no family. Yet what a fortune for the son of my mother. On the Saturday in that same week, I indeed took leave of Herbert and returned to my lonely home, if it deserved the name, for it was now no home to me. I had no home anywhere. Mr Wemmick! I've come, Mr Pip, in my private and personal capacity. <laughs> come in! Will you take a glass of grog uh, before you return to Woolworth? Uh, obliged. I wish to explain the uh, my note concerning the late Compasson. It was from talk of some of his people in trouble that I heard what I did. I kept my ears open until I heard he was absent, and I thought that would be the best time for making the attempt. I can only suppose now that it was part of his policy, as a very clever man, always to deceive his own instruments. You don't blame me, I hope, Mr Pip. I'm sure I tried to serve you with all my heart. I am as sure of that, Mr Wemmick, as you can be, and I thank you most earnestly for all your interest and friendship. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a bad job. Oh, thank you. And I assure you I haven't been so cut up for a long time. What I look at is the sacrifice of so much portable property. Oh, dear me. What I think of, Mr Wemmick, is the poor owner of the property. Oh, yes. Your health. Oh. <laughs> what do you think of my meaning to take a holiday on Monday, Mr Pip? Well, I suppose you've not done such a thing these 12 months. <laughs> 12 years, more likely. More than that... I'm going to take a walk, and I'm going to ask you to take a walk with me. I know your engagements, and I know you're out of sorts, Mr Pip, but if you could oblige me, I should take it as a kindness. Tent a long walk, and it's an early one, so it might occupy you, including breakfast, from 8 to 12. Couldn't you stretch a point and manage it? I'll be pleased to. Punctual to my appointment, I rang at the castle on the Monday morning. Wemmick emerged directly, tighter than usual and having a sleeker hat on, together with a fishing rod. We're not going fishing. No, but I like to walk with one. And we made our way to Camberwell. Hello. Here's a church. Let's go in. Hello? 
Here's a couple of pairs of gloves in my pocket. Let's put them on. As the gloves were white kid, and as the post box was widened to its utmost extent, I began to have my strong suspicions. These were strengthened into certainty when I beheld the aged enter at a side door, escorting a lady. Hello, here's Miss Skiffins. Let's have a wedding. And we did. At the fatal rails, I acted as best man, while a little limp pew opener in a soft baby's bonnet made a feint of being the bosom friend of Miss Skiffins. The aged, giving away the bride, heard nothing. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? Who giveth this woman? Now, aged P, you know who giveth. I do. All right, John. All right, my boy. Good heaven. <laughs> then to an excellent breakfast at a pleasant little tavern, where I drank to the new couple, the aged, the castle, the bride, and above all, drank to Wemmick. Oh, bravo! I wish you all joy, all joy, Mr. Wemmick. She's a fine lady. Thank you. Now I say, Mr. Pip. This is altogether a war of sentiment. Please, after what you let out the other day, Mr. Jaggers may as well not know it. He might think my brain was softening. Eh? Oh. <laughs> he had broken two ribs, and they had wounded one of his lungs. Therefore, he spoke so low as to be scarcely audible, though never to complain. In the infirmary, he being too ill to remain in the common prison, he gradually wasted and became weaker and weaker. The trial was very short and very clear. Such things as could be said for him were said, but nothing could unsay the fact that he had returned. It was impossible to do otherwise than find him guilty. At that time, it was the custom to devote the concluding day to the passing of sentences, and to make a finishing effect. With the sentence of death, I could scarcely believe, even as I write now, that I saw two and thirty men and women put before the judge to receive that sentence together. Foremost among them was he, seated, that he might get breath enough to keep life in him. Of all you wretched creatures now before me. Whom I must single out for special address is the one who, almost from his infancy, has been an offender against the law. One who, after repeated imprisonments and punishments, had been exiled for a term of years. But, in a fatal moment, yielding to those passions, the indulgence of which had so long rendered him a scourge to society. He had quitted his haven of rest and repentance, and returned to the country where he was proscribed. <coughs> the appointed punishment for his return to the land that had cast him out being death, and his case being an aggravated one, he must prepare himself to die. Lord, I have received. My sentence of death from the Almighty, but I bow to yours. I earnestly hoped and prayed that he might die before the recorder's report was made. But that night I began to write out a petition to the Home Secretary, setting forth my knowledge of him and how it was that he had come back for my sake. I wrote as fervently and as pathetically as I could. Then drew up other petitions to such men in authority as I hoped were most merciful, even to the crown itself. For several days and nights I took no rest. Then I would roam the streets of an evening, wandering by those places where I had left the petitions, to no avail. My daily visits were shortened now, as he was strictly kept. After some ten days, I began to see a greater change in him than I had seen yet—an absence of light in his face. Dear boy, I thought you was late, but 
But I know she couldn't be there. It is just the time. I waited for it at the gate. You've never deserted me, dear boy. And what's the best of all? You've been more comfortable along with me since I was under a dark cloud. And when the sun shone, that's best of all. He had spoken his last words. He smiled, and I understood his touch to mean that he wished me to lift my hand and lay it on his breast. I laid it there, and he smiled again and put both his hands upon it. Dear Magwitch, I must tell you, now at last, you understand what I say? A gentle pressure on my hand. You had a child once, whom you loved and lost. She lived and found powerful friends. She is living now. She is a lady and very beautiful. And I love her. With a last faint effort, he raised my hand to his lips, then let it sink gently on his breast again with his two hands lying on it, and his head dropped quietly on his breast. Although I gave notice to quit Garden Court, for I was in bad debt, the truth is I was falling very ill. The late stress had enabled me to put off illness, but not put it away. I knew it was coming on me now. I could not rise. It seemed Magwitch was coming up the stairs. I had to find the boat. Lights blew out. There was an iron furnace burning in the corner of the room. Miss Havisham's in there! It seemed this vapor of the lime kiln was coming between me and two men. Well, sir, this is a matter that you'll soon arrange, I dare say, but you're arrested. What is the debt? 123 pounds, 15 and 6, jewelers. You better come to my home. I'll keep a very nice house. If you take me from here, I think I shall die. By the way, you see my state. I don't know what they did, but they didn't remove me. I know I passed through fever, and I sometimes struggled with real people thinking they were murderers. And then I would sink exhausted in their arms, knowing them to be good, and suffer them to lay me down. But above all, I know that there was a constant tendency of all these people, however extraordinarily transformed, to settle, sooner or later, into the likeness of Joe. Is it Joe? Which is there, old chap? Oh, Joe. You break my heart. Look angry at me, Joe. Joe, don't be so good to me. Oh, God bless you, you gentle Christian man. How long, dear Joe, have I... Hold my hand. Which you mean to say, Pip, how long has your illness took? Yes, Joe. Tomorrow is the first of June, Pip. And have you been here all the time? Pretty nigh, old chap. <sighs> As I says to Biddy when the news of your being ill were brought by letter, how you might be among strangers, and then how you and me haven't been ever the best of friends, a visit at such a moment might not prove unacceptable. Oh, it's so good to hear you, Joe. Biddy, her word were, go to him without loss of time. And here I am. 
No, you're not to talk, so I'll write the letter to Biddy. Joe? Pip, old chap. Miss Havisham. Is she dead? She ain't living. Have you heard what became of her property? Well, old chap, it do appear that she had settled the most of it, which I mean to say tidied up, on Miss Estella. Well, our shovelful today. Now, old Orlick, he's been a-busting open the dwelling house. Who's? Whatsomever the failings on his part, you were a corn and seedsman in his heart. Humble chum. That's it, Pip. <laughs> they took his till and cash box, they drinked his wine, ate his whittles, they slapped his face, pulled his nose, they tied him up to his bedpost and they gave him a dozen, and they stuffed his mouth full of flour in annuals to prevent his crying out. <laughs> but he knowed Orlick, and Orlick's in the county jail. <laughs> oh, Joe, I'm better. But, as I became stronger, so Joe became less easy with me. Did he believe this innocent good man, I would again go cold on him and cast him off. I knew I had to tell him what I really felt. That way the change between us would be banished forever. I feel thankful that I've been ill, Joe. Dear old Pip, old chap. You're almost come round, sir. It's been a memorable time for me. Likewise for myself, sir. We have had a time together, Joe, that I can never forget. There were days once, I know, that I did for a while forget. But I shall never forget these. Pip, there has been larks. And dear sir, what have been betwixt us have been. You sure you is as well as this morning? Yes, dear Joe. Quite. Good night. The next morning on the breakfast table, I found his note. Not wishful to intrude, I have departured. For you are well again, dear Pip, and will do better without. Joe. P.S. Ever the best of friends. Enclosed in the letter was a receipt for the debt and costs on which I had been arrested. I had never dreamed Joe had paid the money, but the receipt was in his name. Oh, Joe. What remained but for me to follow him to the dear old forge and tell everything, and relieve my mind and heart of another growing purpose? Biddy. <clears throat> Biddy. I, th I, th I think you once liked me very well. I mean, uh, if, if, if you can like me only half as well, once more. No, I, I hope I am a little worthier of you than I was. If you can tell me you will go through the world with me, you will surely make it a better place and me a better man for it. And I will try hard to make it a better world for you. Hmm. Biddy, Biddy, I, I, I think you once liked me very well. I, if you can, if you can like me only hard. Early in the morning, while my breakfast was getting ready, I strolled round by Satis house. There were printed bills on the gate. The house was to be sold as old building materials and pulled down. This made it only the pleasanter to turn to Biddy and Joe. The schoolhouse where Biddy was mistress was empty. No children were there and her house was closed. But the forge was a very short distance off, but deserted too. No clink of Joe's hammer, no glittering shower of sparks. Only the windows to the best parlour seemed to imply use, open and gay with flowers. Pip! Oh, Pip! 
Then Joe and Biddy stood before me. In another moment, she was in my embrace. We wept to see each other, she so fresh and pleasant, and me so worn and white. Dear Biddy, how smart you are. Yes, dear Pip. And Joe, how smart you are. Hi, Pip. <laughs> it's my wedding day, and I am married to Joe. Dear Biddy, you have the best husband in the whole world. Yes. And dear Joe, you have the best wife in the whole world, and she will make you as happy as even you deserve to be, you dear, good, noble Joe. <laughs> Both of you, receive my humble thanks for all you have done for me and all I have so ill repaid. And when I say that I am going away within the hour, for I am soon going abroad, and that I shall never rest until I have worked for the money with which you have kept me out of prison and have sent it to you. Don't think, dear Joe and Biddy, that if I could repay it a thousand times over, I suppose I could cancel a farthing of the debt I owe you, or that I would do so if I could. Pray tell me that you forgive me. I need to carry the sound of those words away with me. Oh, dear old Pip, old chap, God knows as I forgive you, if I have anything to forgive. Amen, and God knows I do. I sold all I had, and within a month I went out and joined Herbert as a clerk to Clariker and Co. I must not leave it to be supposed that we were ever a great house, or that we made mints of money. We owed so much to Herbert's ever cheerful industry and readiness that I often wondered how I had ever conceived the old idea of his ineptitude until I was one day enlightened by the reflection that perhaps the ineptitude had never been in him at all, but in me. One evening in December, some eleven years later, I lifted the latch of the old kitchen door at the forge to find Joe, a little grey in his old place, and fenced into the corner by his knee, me. We give him the name of Pip for your sake, dear old chap. And we hoped he might grow a little bit like you. And we think he'd do. Biddy, you must give Pip to me one of these days. Or lend him at all events. No, no, you must marry. <laughs> so Herbert and Clara say. But I don't think I shall... I'm already quite an old bachelor. Tell me, as an old friend, have you quite forgotten her? My dear Biddy, I've forgotten nothing in my life that ever had a foremost place there. But that poor dream, as I used to call it, has all gone by, Biddy. All gone by. I oh, hear she's unhappy. He used her with great cruelty and lost all her money. He's dead now. He died consequent on ill-treating a horse. After dinner, I walked through a cold, silvery mist to Satis House. The evening was not dark. I could trace out where every part of the old house had been. Then... Along the desolate garden walk came a solitary figure. Estella. I am greatly changed. I wonder you knew me. Do you often come back? I have never been here since. Nor I. Poor, poor old place. The ground belongs to me. It is the only possession I have not relinquished. Everything else has gone, little by little. But I've kept this. It was the subject of the only determined fight I made in all those wretched years. It's to be built on. I came to take leave of it. You live abroad still? Still. And do well, I'm sure. I work pretty hard. Yes. I've often thought of you. 
of late, very often. There was a long, hard time when I kept far from me the remembrance of what I had thrown away when I was quite ignorant of its worth. But since my duty has not been incompatible with the admission of that remembrance, I have given it a place in my heart. You have always held your place in my heart. You said to me, God bless you. God forgive you. If you could say that to me then, please say it to me now. When suffering has been stronger than all other teaching and has taught me to understand what your heart used to be. Pip, I have been bent and broken, but I hope into a better shape. Be as considerate and good to me as you were, and tell me we are friends. We are friends. And we'll continue friends apart. I took her hand in mine, and we went out of the ruined place. And as the morning mists had risen long ago when I first left the forge, so the evening mists were rising now. And in all the broad expanse of tranquil light they showed to me, I saw no shadow of another parting from her. In Great Expectations, Pip was played by Douglas Hodge, Magwitch by Robert Lang, Joe by Jim Carter, and Biddy by Emma Gregory. John Shrapnel was Jaggers, James Simmons, Herbert, Timothy Bateson, Wemmick, and Michael Turner, The Aged. Estella was played by Amanda Redman. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Technical presentation was by Peter Brand, Tim Thorne, and Yasmin Dastur. The music was composed by Malcolm Clark. Great Expectations was dramatized by Ray Jenkins and directed by Sally Avens.